How many of you know that God's not dead? You know, this morning, uh, I wanted to mention also, I just wanted to say that we're starting a brand new series. Today is the first day of our brand new series. And this series is called, How to Get Through What You're Going Through. Anybody in here besides me ever, ever go through some stuff in life? I'll tell you, we all get in situations where we're going through stuff in life, and it may be a job problem, it may be a school issue, it may be a health issue, it may be a marriage issue, maybe a non-marriage issue, maybe uh, financial problems, family drama. I'm sure none of y'all ever have any family drama, right? Or maybe you've suffered the loss of some type. The thing is, Jesus said in this world, in this world, you will, let me quote the scripture, in this world, you will have trouble. But he followed that by saying, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The fact that Jesus is alive represents him overcoming the world and overcoming all the issues that we all go through every day. A lot of people, you know, come to church and say, well, I get that God is good and he's alive and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, how does that work in my life? Well, that's what we need to know. But we also need to understand that God is there to get us through whatever we're going through. The next two Sundays, we're going to especially deal about how to get through what you're going through in marriage issues. So if any of you have had any marriage issues, anybody besides me, Sal, and I ever have any marriage issues? We all do. Well, guess what? God has answers to get us through those situations. So the next two Sundays, we're going to specifically deal with that. And my beautiful wife, Pastor Sally, is going to be talking to all of you, uh, uh, you ladies especially. The next week, I'll be talking to men especially. But she's going to be talking about how to love your husband despite them being just, you know, whatever. <laughs> but she's going to teach you how to love them, how to have a better marriage. And then the following Sunday, I'm going to get a few husband lessons. So ladies, you'll make sure you want to get your wives here for that. But getting through what you're going through begins with the realization that God is not dead. Now how many of you know there's a lot of people out there today who are proclaiming, no, there is no God. God is dead. There is no God. I mean, it's a subjective thing, you know. But the truth is, He is not dead despite what the skeptics say. And that's the first point that you have there. God is not dead. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross. But today, on Easter, on Resurrection Day, we are here to celebrate the fact that He didn't stay dead. All right? If you haven't seen the movie, by the way, if you haven't seen the movie God's Not Dead, do yourself, your family a big favor. Take them all, your friends, and go see this movie because it's an amazing movie. Did you realize that today, if you are a child or a teenager or a student in public school who's not raised in a Christian home where somebody's taking you to church every week, the only time you ever hear the name Jesus Christ is if somebody's cussing. Right? It's true. It's true. Our universities and the writers of our children's public uh, books believe that anybody, you know, our public school books, they won't talk about God. They won't mention God. They won't mention even the fact that the history of our nation comes from a solid foundation from the Bible itself. But they won't talk about that. They won't mention that. They won't talk about it. And in fact, many of them uh, in the top universities and in, in the top of academia believe that those of us who do believe in the existence of God should be seen as unintelligent, uneducated, flat earth fools. I mean, you know, that's a thought process is out there. So for many people, the belief in God, especially Christianity, is something that really should be taught against. Let me tell you something. I have no problems with anybody asking me questions about the faith that I have in Christ. The Bible says we always ought to be able to answer for the faith that we have in God. So we have answers, and the evidence is overwhelming when you look at it. You say, what about science? Well, let me give you some scientific arguments this morning. The first one I'm going to give you, A, comes from the science of cosmology. Now, ladies, we're not talking about your hairdressers. We're talking about a science called cosmology, which is the study of the universe, the cosmos. For 2,500 years, now I want you to listen to this. For 2,500 years, science believed that there was a beginning, that there was there was not a beginning to the universe. They believed in what was called the static Earth theory. The universe had always been there; it had just always existed. That's what science believed for 2,500 years. But for a few years ago, scientists started looking through these massive telescopes.
telescopes like Hubble, and they discovered evidence that finally caught them up to what the Bible has said the entire time, that there was a beginning to this universe. And it exploded out of nothing, and they called it, that science calls it, the Big Bang. Science says the Big Bang. Pastor Jerry, you believe in the late Big Bang? Yes, I do. I believe in the Big Bang because I know who banged it. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I'll just tell you right now. It takes an incredible amount of faith. I can't believe that there was something that came from nothing that wasn't there and somehow created everything for no reason at all. I can't believe that. And I've asked Peace Out to come out and show you something because in the beginning, the Bible says in Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God, everybody say, in the beginning, God, in the beginning, God. Created, created the heavens and the earth. God spoke the word, the Big Bang started, and flung the stars across the universe. Maybe you can do it flinging. She's flinging. Alright, okay, she's playing. So, God, I want, to, I want to point out something interesting to you. Did you know that the Greeks, at the same time the Bible was being written, at the same time the Old Testament Scriptures were being written, 2,600 years ago, at the same time the Greeks, who were flat out brilliant people, very intelligent people, they believed that the earth sat upon Atlas, a God named Atlas, they believed the earth sat upon his shoulders. He looked kind of like Hercules. That's what they believe. At the same time that the Bible was saying God created the heavens and the earth. Did you know at the same time God was saying the heavens and the earth were created by God and He spoke them into existence and the big bang occurred. At the same time that was being written, the Hindus believe that the earth was sitting on top of a big turtle. A big turtle. Tortoise. And that's why there were earthquakes. That's how I explained earthquakes. They said the tortoise was moving. That's what the Hindus believe. And I could go into other cultures that believe similar things. But the Bible says in Job 26, God stretches the sky. I want you to see the scripture. God stretches the sky over the empty space and hangs the earth on what? Nothing. Nothing. That's what was written 2,600 years ago and everybody else thought it was being held up by a man or being walked on the back of a turtle. God said it. Everybody knows the earth is hung on nothing now. But how did Job know it when he wrote those words in the Bible? God told it. That's how. Amen. For thousands of years, science said the number of stars were infinite. In other words, you couldn't get uh, or, or pardon me, the, the science actually said the number of stars was finite. Not infinite, finite. Which means they can be counted. Do you know why? They can count about 4,000 stars with their eyes. And that's why they believe that the amount of stars were finite and were limited. Because they could only count about 4,000. I mean, you know, a lot of us just go by what we see. Well, that's what I see. But God goes beyond what we can see. God goes beyond what we can feel. God goes beyond what our minds have the capability of knowing. And so for thousands of years, science said the, earth, the amount of stars are finite. There's about 4,000. Yet 2,600 years ago, long before telescopes, the Bible said in Jeremiah 33, 22, look at it. The number of stars are infinite. Infinite means uncountable. You cannot even number how many stars there are. Now, how did he know that 2,600 years ago? Did you know that January before last, the Hubble telescope discovered new galaxies with billions of new stars? All of cosmology had to change their science and add more stars and more to the universe. Guess what? Nobody had to change the Bible. We've never had to change the Bible. It's nonsense to say that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate. That either means you don't know science or you don't know the Bible. One of the two. The universe is precisely tweaked and is so full of life, the amount of information in one human cell is enough to fill 5,200 page books. One cell in your body is enough to fill 5,000.
200 page books. Guess how many cells you have in your body? 75 trillion. 75 trillion cells. It didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen by accident. Look at what Psalms 139 14 says. I want to put this on the screen. I will give thanks to you. Oh God, that's what we're doing this morning. I've been so amazingly and miraculously made. Say miraculously made. Miraculously made. Guess what, folks? We didn't evolve from a swine suit. We were purposely designed and purposely created by a loving creator who knew every aspect, who knew every molecule, who knew every part of DNA. You are so different than the person next to you. Your DNA is not the same as the person. And if you match it to six billion other people, you won't find somebody who has the exact same DNA as you have. That's how amazing your creator God is. But it's not what you can see. Because everybody kind of looks alike. We have five, you know, generally have five fingers on each hand. Generally have five toes on each. And we look at each other, we kind of all look alike. But God created you so distinctly and so uniquely that there's not another of you in the entire earth, entire universe. Now, let's talk about something else. Medical science. How about me? Medical science. That's your next point. Now listen, I believe in medical science. But the thing is, medical science keeps changing. If you're my age, you know that they've changed a lot of things in medical science since you were a kid. They changed some things last year in medical science. And the thing about it is, did you know that for thousands of years, doctors believed that there, if you had too much blood, too much blood in your body could make you sick. So they did something called bloodletting. They would cut your body, bleed you out some, and that was supposed to make you well. That was supposed to make you uh, keep you from being sick. Our first president, this may shock some of you, this is not that long ago, our first president died from bloodletting. He had a heart problem, and so the doctor said, well, we need, to, we need to get some blood out of the system. And so they, they bled him once, they bled him twice, and they bled him three times until he bled to death. That was the science of the day. That was the medical information of the day. And it changes all the time. Today, we know just the opposite. We give people blood when they're sick. Because we know today that life is in the blood. Well, guess what? In Leviticus 17, 11, it took that the scientists thousands of years to catch up to this. But all they had to do was read the Bible. Because the Bible says in Leviticus 17, the life of every creature is in the blood. Now, how did, they, how did, how did he know to write that? How did Moses know that? God told him. Did you know in the Middle Ages... 1200s, things like that. There was a bubonic plague that killed one out of every four people in Europe. One out of every four. If there's four of you in your family, one of you dies. We didn't understand germs back then. We didn't. In fact, we didn't understand germs until Louis Pasteur in, in, in 1861. I mean, we didn't understand what, what the deal was with germs uh, during the Civil War. Million, I mean, uh, just to hundreds of thousands of our men died from germs. You know, a, a, a little bullet in the in the arm here could kill you. You know, they'd walk, try to wipe it off. They didn't get to wipe it off, but they would kill you because they didn't understand germs. They didn't understand infection. They didn't understand quarantine. But guess what? All medical science had to do was read the Bible because thousands of years before the blue body plague, look at what it says in Leviticus 13. Put an infected person in quarantine for seven days. And then you know what, they, you know what the Bible says after that? If they're still sick after seven days, you put them in and you leave them in quarantine for another seven days and then you release them. Guess what? It turned out that the Bible was right all along. And if we had just read the Bible, if we had known what the Bible said, the Bible is always ahead of science. God creates, men discover. Come on. What God creates. God creates, men discover. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is flawless. Now, where are you going with this, Pastor Jerry? This is, uh, this is uh, Easter. This is Resurrection Day. Let me tell you what. Jesus couldn't have resurrected if there wasn't a God alive to resurrect him. If he wasn't God and Son of God, he couldn't have risen from the dead. I want you to look at the New Testament so you understand. Let's look at the New Testament of Jesus. So you understand on this Easter, this Resurrection Day, the kind of God you serve. 
Number one, I want you to understand how valid the Bible is. Now we usually do this. I'm going to do this right now. I want you to hold up your. I want you to hold up your Bibles. I have my Bible on my cell phone. I have it on my iPad. I have it on my my uh, MacBook. And I also have the covers. You know, with the leather and, and, and paper covers. Jesus had a scroll. However, you have the Word of God. Make sure you get the Word of God in your life. Get the Word of God in your life. Carry it. I like it on my phone because I carry it with me every day. Bam, pop it up and it comes up with my memory verses, my, my verses that I want to learn, my Bible studies. And so I love having that. Everybody hold up something that represents the Word of God. You can even hold up your note sheet if you don't have your Bible up. Hold it up and just say, this is the Bible. This is my Bible. The owner's manual for my life. The manual for my life. Written by God. Written by God. Who invented me. If I do what it says... I will be significant, successful, and happy. But if I don't, I won't. So I will. By grace. Through faith. In Jesus. That's the answer. Let me show you some things that how we know that the Word of God is so real and so true. The New Testament. Number one, the New Testament was written early. It was written, did you know 1 Corinthians was written by 55 AD? You say, PJ, I'm not sure what that means. Well, here's what it means. It's huge because the historical accounts of the resurrection go back to when it happened around 36 AD. In 36 AD, that was 19 years earlier than the book of Corinthians was written. But 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 is actually a creed that was memorized and recited verbally by everybody who became a disciple of Jesus Christ, a believer in Jesus Christ, so that they would never forget the facts. So much of, of what was written in the Word of God was oral history, and they would learn it orally. They would memorize it because, remember, all the people couldn't read and write. So they would memorize the Scriptures, and then it was all written down in the Word of God. And Paul had the disciples, Paul and all the disciples, Peter, all the disciples, they had people do the exact same thing. They would memorize, and here's a creed that they would have everybody memorize called the Apostles' Creed. Look it up. It's up on the Scripture. I want you to see it. It says, Christ died to take away our sins. This is all about the resurrection. Christ died to take away our sins as the Scriptures predicted. He was placed in a tomb. He was brought back to life on the third day as the Scriptures predicted. He appeared to Peter. Next, He appeared to the twelve apostles. Then He appeared to more than 500 believers at one time. Most of these people are still living, but some have died. Next, He appeared to James. That was, that James was His brother who became the first pastor. Then He appeared to all the apostles. Then Paul says, last of all, He also appeared to me I am like an aborted fetus who was given life. Now this creed was adopted, memorized, spread, and then recorded by Paul 19 years after the resurrection to be remembered to this very day. Aren't you glad Paul wrote it down so we can all know it to this very day? The book of Acts was written by 62. Not 1962, 62. Now that was just a short time later. 62, that was less than 30 years later. And remember, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, wrote the book of Luke before he wrote the book of Acts. Now how hard do you think it would be for us to go find people who are still alive during President Reagan's uh, presidency? Uh, they do it all the time. I was alive then too. Wrote and, and wrote a history of it. It's not very hard. You go find people who were there. You can find people who were in his cabinet. People who served with him. Write down everything. They'll remember things that he said. Uh, they'll remember things that he did. How hard would that be today? That's not very hard. If you're a documentarian, if you're a historian, it's easy. It's easy to do. Well, that's what Luke did. And it's very easy. Number two, eyewitnesses. We've got three E's, uh, 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 three E's I want to point out to you. Number one, the Bible, the New Testament was written early. Number two, it was written by eyewitnesses. Luke recorded the testimonies of eyewitnesses. If you don't think that Luke was an incredibly accurate historian, I want you just to read with me a portion of the scripture right here that shows that he was. Luke 3, 1 through 2. Look at how this is written. Now this is the part that we skip over when we read the Bible because it's like boring to us. But this shows you how accurate and how credible 
Luke, what he writes is, as a historian, look at this. It says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Eturia, and Trachonitis, Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John the Baptist. Does that sound like some guy just making up a story? Does, does that sound anything like a fairy tale to you? Once upon a time, in a far, far, far away land, there once lived a man named Jesus. It doesn't sound like that. This is well documented. Luke was a, physical, a doctor who was highly educated, and when he was writing down history, he named dates, he named times, he named people, he named places, and it's all backed up by other secular uh, people, and they've all seen that the archaeology of today, we go and discover continually that he was right, he was accurate. The Word of God is alive. It's true. It's real. Your Jesus Christ is real, and he's alive. The Word is alive. Number three, I want to point out the third point. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. The historical documentation principles say this about when you're writing a piece of literature to, to know whether it's, whether it's accurate or not. It says if a writing contains embarrassing information about the author or the authors, it's probably true. Well, guess what? The Bible is full of embarrassing stories that were written by the authors themselves. How many of you, how many, you know, I could, how many of us could write a few embarrassing things about ourselves? How I many of you know you don't write that stuff down unless you're trying to give purpose and meaning and, and, and help somebody else change situations in their lives? And I appreciate people who will stand up and talk about the truth of the way their life was before Christ and before finding Him. And even in their journey along the way, their stumbles and their faults and faults. I appreciate people who will stand up because they're not telling lies when they're talking about embarrassing facts. And that's the way it was in the New Testament. One of the most memorable, one of the most memorable things that was embarrassing was St. Peter himself. We all know St. Peter, the guy who's supposed to be standing at the gates. You know, the, the Bible doesn't say that, but you know, it's, it's traditionally thought that that may be true. But Peter denied denied that he even knew Jesus three times. He denied that he even knew Jesus Christ three times. How embarrassing! Not only did it, not all the disciples denied Jesus except for John, one John. He was the only one that stayed across. The rest of them ran off like cowards. Peter even wrote in the Bible that one time Jesus called him Satan. You know, if I was if I was a Peter, I might have said, hey, Mark was his transcriber. The book of Mark, that's actually the story written from Peter's uh, 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 account of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, but if I was if I was Peter, I probably would have said, hey, Mark, you know that part I told you about Jesus calling me Satan? Maybe we should just leave that out. <laughs> Once Jesus calls you Satan, get behind him. You know, and I, that was an embarrassing moment. But when you're telling the truth, it makes all the difference in behind. And here's one of the most embarrassing uh, truths that they wrote, I think, as men. Who, who, John, I mean, except for John, all the disciples run off like cowards. Peter denies Jesus three times. And guess who they leave to discover Jesus' resurrection? Yes. The women! The women! I mean, look, let me tell you something. Back then, women were viewed as property. And all over the world, I know places I've traveled all over the world, and they're still that way sometimes. Women are viewed as property. They weren't even allowed to be educated during this time that this was written. Let me tell you something. Dishonest men don't write about how the women were braver than the men were. Hello, men? They wouldn't make that kind of stuff up. That's not the stuff you make up. Now, if it was me writing it, you know, I probably would have said something like this. When I found out Jesus was buried down there, I marched down to that tomb, tomb kicked some Roman butt, moved the stone, and then I and then I and then I comforted the trembling women. <laughs> right, man? Ooh, 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 ooh. That's right. That's, I mean, that's what you write. That's what you write, especially in that day. That's what the men would write. But no. They let me tell you something. When it comes to the Bible, instead, they wrote the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help them God. Let's talk about miracles for a moment. This one really gets skeptics, really get upset about miracles. 
really get upset about miracles. So we talked about the documentation. What's the greatest miracle in the Bible? What's the greatest? Is it the Red Sea? Parting the Red Sea? Is it Jonah? You know, being swallowed by the, the great fish? How about Jericho? The walls falling down? Or Jesus walking on the water? Maybe feeding the 5,000? The healings that He did? Maybe the virgin birth? What's the greatest miracle? The resurrection? We're certainly here to celebrate. But you know what? Actually, the greatest miracle is the first verse of the Bible that says, In the beginning was the heavens and the earth. Why? Why is that the greatest miracle? Because if there is a God who can come from nowhere, stand on nothing, and create everything, it makes every other miracle easy to believe. Right? If the Creator God is true, then it's easy to believe He can part the Red Sea if He created the Red Sea. Right? All right. Can He make a man survive the fish if He created the fish? All right. Can He send His only begotten Son to the earth in human flesh if He created fair flesh? Uh oh, uh oh. Can He cause Jesus to be born of a virgin uh, if He designed human conception and birth in the first place? Can He cause Jesus to walk on water if He created water? Can He open blind eyes if He created eyes? Can He heal sick bodies if He created bodies to begin with? Can He multiply three tortillas and two pieces of fish in order to make fish tacos for 5,000? See, Dios se puede. Yes, God can. He absolutely can. He absolutely can. Let me ask you something else. Can He raise Jesus Christ from the dead if He created life in the first place? Can He raise Jesus Christ from the dead if He created life in the first place? Can He raise Jesus Christ from the dead yeah. if He created life in the first place? Yes, He can, and yes, He did. That's the God that we serve. That's the kind of God we serve. Is there anything too hard for the God that we serve? No, there's nothing too hard. Pastor, why are you yelling at me? I just get a little excited. I love my buddy Joel Osteen. Sometimes I wish I could just sit there and smile and talk. But I'm a little animated. I get a little animated. And I just want to let you know that I get excited because I know that Jesus left that cross. And He's no longer in the grave. Nobody's ever found His bones. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Now the question for you and I today is very simple. Can the God who came from nowhere stood on nothing and created everything, get you through what you're going through? Can you do that? If you're going through something right now today and you're just like, man, I don't know how I'm going to go through this, PJ. I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, man. You, you just don't understand. There's so many situations. There's so many circumstances. You, you just don't understand. Uh, you know, I mean, this relationship... It's just not working. You don't understand, PJ. Uh, my bank account is just not adding up. My, my job situation, you don't understand. You don't understand the, the health attack that I've had on, on my body. I mean, you just don't understand. You don't understand the, the, the things that are surrounding me. You don't understand the financial challenges I have out there and the, and the lack that is there. You don't understand. I need this and I... You don't understand. You know what? You're right. I can't understand, but you serve a God who can't understand. And you serve a God who can't do anything and who will, and who has promised that if you understand, He's not dead. He's the resurrection and the life. He will come and grave. You don't understand, PJ. There's nobody out there for me to marry. And I want to get married. Let me tell you something. God, if God can do what He's done, can't He find that right match for you? I'll tell you, uh, Match.com, I'm, I'm not against any of all that stuff. But I believe Match.Jesus, His Lord, is the one who's going to that. Okay. God has the great plan for your life. And the Bible says that we also have a part to play. Because, yes, God can, but guess what? He created you and I to have the power of choice. And He won't force me to believe. And He won't force me to follow His plan. God says in Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. And the Word dwelt among us. And that was talking about Jesus Christ. My beginning, or my new beginning, begins with me realizing that a decision needs to be made about asking Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord. The truth is, most people do believe in God in this country. At least 85% of them do. It's dwindling. It's getting less and less. You know why? Because we don't talk about the stuff I talked about today. That's why I took time to go into some details so you'd understand there's no reason that you have to stand in front of a college professor who's declaring to you there's no evidence for God and say, I'm sorry. I've got plenty of evidence. I've got plenty of evidence. I don't just believe just by... See, people think that we just believe because of faith. Well, that's just faith. You just believe it. Yes, it's faith, but it's faith based upon sound reason and sound evidence. See, making Jesus your Lord and your Savior means that this. Most people do believe in God, but God says this. Just believing is not enough. Wow. PJ, what are you talking about? Just believing that there is a God is not enough. Just believing that there is a Jesus is not enough. Just believing that Jesus went to a cross and died for your sins is not enough. Just believing there is a resurrection at an Easter is not enough. Jesus even said, and well, James said it, his brother James, who wrote this in James 2, said this, you believe that there is one God that's good, and he said, even the demons believe in tremor. Demons believe in God. Did you know that? But they sold their souls to the devil. Even Satan believes there is a God, but Jesus said, I have to follow Him. God says I have to make Jesus my Lord and my Savior. What's the difference, Pastor Jerry? Making Jesus my Savior, and I want you to pull that in your blank, making Jesus my Savior means I ask Him to forgive me of my sins and trust that He will. Making Jesus my Lord means I decide that He's in charge of my life. Everything I am, everything I have, everything I'll do, everything I surrender to His will and to His way. I decide I'm going to get started on the journey of following Him. When Jesus says, follow me in baptism, you know what I do? I get baptized. When Jesus, see, when I'm making Jesus Lord of my life, He's not just saying He's Lord of my life. And Jesus said, I want you to be transformed. I want you to be changed. Then what do I do? I say, yes, sir. I'm going to let you change me. When Jesus said, I should be a part of a church and go every week and train my children up in church and raise them to know the living God. When He says that in the Bible, then what is my part? I say, yes, sir. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow Him. I'm going to follow Him because I decided to follow Jesus. When Jesus says to follow me, why do I do that? Why do I follow Jesus? Why? Because I realize He loves me more than I can love myself. Go write that down. He can make me better than I can make myself. He can make me happier than I can make myself.